Well, so we, you know, we'll, we're going to post a. <laughs> Hang on, we got a time out there. <laughs> I've got the cat rolling in, screaming his head <laughs> off. Mark Graben and Jamie Flinchball are two guys drinking whiskey while chatting about lean ideas, experiences, and news. Let's hope they hold their liquor because they're not holding back on sharing their opinions. It's time for Lean Whiskey, Lean Talk with a Fun Spirit. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to episode number four of Lean Whiskey. I'm Mark Graben, and we've got our original co-host back with us today, Jamie Flinchbaugh. How's it going? I I am back. It's uh, good to be back. Very uh, excited to do this episode. Um, been been a crazy time for the past uh, couple of weeks as my my wife and uh, second uh, child is in France and Spain for ten days uh, watching the Women's World Cup and playing oh, soccer wow. and and doing touristy things as well. So uh, we're looking forward to welcoming them home soon. You what's what's hold, been a, having to hold? You having to hold down the fort uh, as best I can, uh, as best I can. Uh, and what's been, what's been up with you? Well, so it, it's fine. So, you know, as co-host here, Jamie has family with kids, my wife and I, it's just the two of us. So, uh, I don't want you to hate me for this, Jamie, but we had a chance to spend two days in Louisville, Kentucky, We just <laughs> got home yesterday. Um, my wife had some work in Louisville Friday morning and, Oh, see, a couple of weeks ago, she said, well, I was supposed to be flying home from consulting. And she said, why don't you just come to Louisville? And, you know, that that was not a tough, a tough sell. Not a tough sell. She's brilliant for asking. And uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I I did happen to catch the uh, the list of whiskey you tried, sampled. Yeah. Um, quite an impressive list of uh, a whole bunch of things I haven't had yet. So yeah, well, hopefully we'll we'll get to talk about those sometime. I did get to go back to David Myers Glen Creek Distilling and and pop in and um, buy a couple of more bottles and half bottles from him. It's always great seeing David, and uh, I know he listened to episode two when we talked about him. And he's, he's making good, he's making good progress there. Yeah, I, I love I love seeing the passion he's pouring into his product. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's truly an exercise of trying to build, build a better product. And you can, you can see that and how he's approaching it. And that's, and we, you know, we, we've both enjoyed the, uh, the output of that effort. Yeah. And we uh, enjoy other outputs, which I guess brings us back to one of the other features of the lean whiskey podcast. Yeah. So this is a feature that you know, we may change some things over the years if we keep this up, but we'll always start with a whiskey. So yeah. Um, so this this week we're we we're choosing a, a Japanese whiskey. Um, we did have to check to make sure we both had one in stock, um, and we didn't stray too far from each other. Um, but mine is the uh, the, the Nika uh, Takitsura Pure Malt, um, which is their product actually named in honor of uh, Masataka Takitsura, who is really the the father of Japanese whiskey and the uh, you know, it, it's, he, he, I, I remember watching a documentary, not just about him, but about uh, Scotch in general. And he, uh, he, he went to, went to Scotland and worked and it was never really clear whether he was intended to return to Japan, but hmm. he, he wasn't just touring and learning. He was, he was an employee. He was working in the distilleries in Scotland. I believe a, a couple different ones. I cannot remember which ones for the life of me, but returned to Japan in 1934 to start the industry there. And the industry has brought up some fantastic high quality whiskeys. And so, yeah, this one's named after him, uh, this Nika, and it's, they call it an entry level Nika. Um, certainly a lot cheaper than some of them, but it's, it's color is fantastic. It's creamy. It's smooth. It's, uh, it's, it's really enjoyable, you know, neat. Um, I sampled some with my father this weekend and, and he, he really liked it as well. Yeah. So Jamie chose this one first. And so I went to the shelf and I wish we could try these side by side. We're recording this through, uh, through a zoom meeting and we're watching each other drink 
the whiskey, but I, I chose one called the Nika Coffee Malt. So it's from the same Nika distillery. It's also um, from that Scottish Scotch style, 100% malted barley. And it's called coffee malt, not, you know, people think, oh, it must taste like coffee. Well, no, it's, um, it's actually named after the man who invented what they call the first continuous still, uh, Aeneas Coffee, invented that in 1930. So uh, Takatsuru, uh, it says on their website, he valued uh, that type of still, uh, you know, for the, you know, retaining the flavor of the ingredients. And I think from a lean perspective, because uh, when we were in Louisville, we saw distillers that have what they call continuous stills, where you're just you continuously pump in uh, the the at that point the raw material, the the distiller's beer, and it, it continually outputs whiskey, as opposed to a pot still, which they use in Scotland, which is absolutely a batch process. They distill a batch of whiskey, then you have to stop and clean it out. So I don't know if this makes it lean. It's tasty. <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 interesting. I I I, I did in this particular uh, documentary I watched, which was a multiple episode uh, show. I have no idea what it was called, but they, they they visited lots of distilleries throughout Scotland, primarily, and and uh, certainly the high vol- some of the high volume producers are now into continuous stills, just because it's easier to get the output mm-hmm. at a high volume, but. But a lot of people swear by the pot stills. It, there's no question that the shape of the still and the everything involved in the still itself is a has an impact on the flavor. But there certainly doesn't seem to be a consensus that pot still versus continuous still is preferred. It 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 seems that whatever anybody's using, that's what they think is the better the better method. Yeah. Well, so you know, in Scotch production. I think that I think by law they have to use pot stills because there was a note on the Nika website that says even though this coffee malt is made from 100% malted barley, they can't technically categorize it as a malt whiskey because it's not distilled in a pot still. But you know, in Kentucky, you see some places do pot stills. We went to Wild Turkey, and the one thing that blew me away is every single drop of Wild Turkey, and there's a lot of it all comes off of one single enormous still, a continuous still, uh, which wow. is interesting. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, and this is clearly, uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious what they did when wild turkey was considered, you know, high-end, high-shelf, mm-hmm. uh, you know, back in 70s and before. Were they pot stills then or were they continuous stills? Uh, it's, it's really, I, I don't know my history very well. Yeah. Um, and it's, and it's, it's so hard. There's so many different variables that affect a, a whiskey. It's hard to say whether, you know, how much is the still and how much is the grain and how much is the water and how much is the barrel. It's, it's all of these things mixed together. And, and, uh, and that's, that's the beauty of scotch and, and other whiskeys is you, uh, you get tremendous variation and that, that makes it fun to explore. Yeah. And, and you can see, you can taste the differences. You know, Wild Turkey has some really inexpensive whiskeys and they have some higher end, really highly regarded whiskeys. And I think Nika is sort of the same way. You, you know, uh, you can taste kind of the whole line and look for similarities. Is it just difference in age or, you know, sometimes that's the variable. Sometimes it's other things. Yep. Yeah, so um, you know, you mentioned we're not sitting next to each other comparing. I'm sure our our whiskey section of this would be a lot longer if we were sitting next to each other. <laughs> so you're saying it's time to move on? <laughs> it's time to move on to lean news. Um, and so we have a couple articles today that are related. We'll make that tie in as we we go forward. Um, but I was, yeah, you know, I've always as a author for Industry Week, I I always check out what they're writing. And uh, they, they wrote an article basically talking about KPIs. And essentially what this does is they do surveys and do the, the best plants and all of this. They collect a, a lot of data. Um, not a ton of data, but a lot of data. And so they've compared, picked a whole bunch of different metrics from safety to quality to cost improvements. Um, and, and basically looked at 
uh, year over year over year, best and worst and average, um, and started to compare them, uh, just provide them out there as a, as a list of KPI performance metrics for manufacturing. Yeah. Well, and my first reaction when I looked at this when you sent it, said article and it says start slideshow and I thought oh no it's a listicle as they call them. Yeah it was it wasn't Buzzfeed. not my favorite format <laughs> and uh, I had the same reaction and almost immediately closed it to be honest. Um, <laughs> but then I started clicking and I and I started looking at the numbers and, and each one as I looked at them and we don't need to go into the numbers themselves but I started asking myself okay this is this is interesting but what's what's the value? Mm. And, and, and so there's such a diverse diversity of manufacturing operations. Um, and, and even within industries, you could have impacts that affect certain metrics to such degree that a comparison seems almost useless. Mm. And, and so, but at the same time, I know it's a common question that I'll get uh, on any metric is, well, how does everybody else do yeah, I mean, it's funny, like in, in the intro, um, before you click and, and view some of these different numbers, it seems like, you know, Industry Week was saying um, that uh, the direct comparisons can be misleading, but the data can prove useful. So, okay, <laughs> it's, it's both misleading and useful. It, it's mis, I think it's misuseful, it's misleading, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. But yeah, I mean, you, you raise a good point. Like, what, what's the value of Benchmarking in general, benchmarking against best plants. I mean, I mean, we could ask, you know, what's what's the may hit the risk unpopular opinion maybe. What's the value of best plants type awards? What's the value of hospitals being or doctors being put on quote unquote best lists? Yeah, and and I, and I think, you know, I, I think we do put a lot into that. I think probably too much because. I don't believe that a lot of the lessons are immediately applicable. And, and with the metrics themselves that are shared, I don't think you can look at, you know, you look at something like on-time ship percentage and it's, well, is that against customer order or customer request date or negotiated ship date? What is that against? And, and so you don't even know what the metric is uh, itself. So, so I think the numbers themselves are, are more misleading but I think where it is useful is it does inspire, at least for people that might be struggling and say, let's say they're at 60% on time. They can look at some of these other metrics and say, hey, other people are doing 100%. Why can't we do something? Why can't we do something more? And, and I think it at least encourages people to ask questions. And, I, and, and if, if that's all it does, I would say it's still useful. Yeah, I mean, on, on the flip side, sometimes benchmarking comparisons lead to a discussion around like, oh, well, we're different than those benchmark cu- uh, companies. And, and there's that you know, sort of negative excuse making tone. And I guess a lot of that probably falls on the leaders of um, the organization or the people looking at those numbers. Um, hopefully it drives improvement or inspires people to question how they're doing things, right? And that's where I think, you know, the value is in the user's hands, right? So any tool, it, the value is in the user's hands. A uh, screwdriver can be, you know, damaging or productive, and a metric can be damaging or productive. And somebody can sit there and go, eh, well, they, they're not looking at the metrics right, and that's a false metric, and discount the whole thing. Yeah. Or they can look at it and say, huh, I wonder how they did it. What do we need to do differently? And that's not the metrics fault. It's not the article's fault. That's, that's sure. in the hands of the user. Yeah. I mean, think about hospitals again. I mean, I think there's some metrics or benchmarks that hopefully are inspiring, seeing what some organizations have done in reducing certain types of infection rates by 90 or 95%. Hopefully that's eye-opening to people. I, I think there's some benchmarking. I think this is particularly a healthcare dysfunction. People look at staffing numbers and benchmark productivity ratios. And sometimes I think that's very much putting the cart before the horse where some organizations might have better processes or better systems that lead to better productivity. You can't just copy that by lowering your staffing numbers and assuming efficiency or better systems will follow. That's one trap I see. Yeah, and that's I, I think 
with with any form of benchmarking, numerical or otherwise, I've I've always said start with your problem statement. Right? Don't don't read the article and then and then ask what you should do. Start with what you're trying to learn more about and then read the article. And 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 the same is true of benchmarking. If you if you frame what you're trying to solve for and then use the data to to help challenge your thinking or inform your thinking or inform the problem statement or the solution space, then it's, it's helped provide some enlightenment, but it's, it's not just wandering off into the wilderness of, of data and, and competition. And then hopefully inspiration strikes. Yeah. Well, I think one of those other metrics that I've seen sometimes really inspire people one of the slides there from Industry Week talked about from their best plant winners, which ones had the most ideas, improvement ideas that were implemented per employee. I think that's a good comparative metric. Um, I, I think it said the best was, you know, 50, roughly 50 ideas per person right. per year. That's really yeah. strong. And, and I've seen healthcare organizations that will look at a benchmark from other industries and, and use that as a way that inspires them. I think Implemented ideas is a good proxy for engagement. It's more of a real-time measure than doing a survey every two years. Absolutely. It's, it, you know, it depends on whether you put a lot of time into measuring it, which, which I, I would argue by itself isn't always value-added. I'd rather people do the action than they do the measuring of the actions. Um, and I, and I, and I, so I have seen sometimes people get too caught up in, in trying to measure it. But absolutely, and and I will also add. I mean, I've been in situations. I remember long, long ago when I was working in a factory. One of my peers basically went around the factory, and if somebody had to tighten a bolt, they captured it as an improvement. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I, yeah. there's a metric that came out, and there's 800 improvements for his department, and and less so for mine. And and there was a little smiley face next to him, as kind of pointing out his heroic efforts, but all he did was game the system. And so, you know, it, any of these can be manipulated. Metrics are not infallible, but well, I think it, that is a one that, 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 that is generally more pure. Yeah. So I've seen that go the other direction instead of kind of artificially just trying to, you know, you know sometimes we won't say, Oh, we had this improvement. No, 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 that was really three. Let's break it down. We'll call it three improvements. The net effect on the organization is the same, but at um, the Franciscan St. Francis Health System in Indianapolis, that's where Joe Schwartz, my healthcare Kaizen book co-author, works. Um, when I, the, the, one of the last times I visited there, we were going through one of the really high-performing Kaizen departments, definitely have this spirit of continuous improvement. And one of the nurses said something like, oh, well, yeah, we do. We make a lot of improvements that we don't put in the system. They have a system. It's an old kind of homegrown database for tracking improvements. And I asked, well, why don't you put them in the system? And she said, oh, we don't care about the points where, you know, the points are kind of a token reward. Um, you know, they, they earn points that they, they can use in the cafeteria and for branded merchandise from, from the health system. And I thought that was really interesting. Like when people are really motivated by the intrinsic making things better motivation to them, the time tracking it didn't seem worthwhile. Right. Right. And that's, and that's always, you know, I, I've, I've maintained for a long time that the best metric that can never be measured is the voluntary efforts to improve as a ratio to the involuntary efforts. Yeah. And that's the health of your, your culture. But of course, to measure it, you have to make all of them, sort of formalized events, right? You start having to track it just to keep track of the voluntary side of the equation and then it ceases to be so voluntary. So yeah. I, I think when it when it takes off and just becomes its own effort, then then not only is the the improvement intrinsic to the employees, but that's when you have a culture where metrics like this are going to be informative and inspire the next question or the next thought about improvement. Yeah. And I'm going to just bring up one other thing from, sorry to take a swipe here at, uh, at Industry Week. Last week, I picked on them for being a monthly publication that calls itself Industry Week. But, <laughs> uh, but one, one, one thing that's kind of a head scratcher, though, on the slide about safety, 
and the safety performance, you know, at least OSHA reportable incident rates. And that's something, unfortunately, that can be gamed if people are not reporting things or pressured not to. But even within this best plants population, like, you know, two years, 2016, 2017, one of the quote unquote best plant winners had almost four times the industry average OSHA reportable incident rates. And so again, like it's the data is useful, the data is misleading. It says here, you know, safety first and safety is paramount, but yet they're giving, like, I don't, I don't know if that should really be deemed the best plant if they've got four times the industry average injury rate. Yeah. And I don't know if that was, uh, or if that was just among the applicants, um, was but, it the applicants? Okay. You know, I'd, well, it I'd says your winners and what says winners and finalists. Oh, that may be. So yeah, that, I mean, who knows if they have any, you know, immediately disqualifying metrics, but you'd think that would be one. That's certainly, uh, I saw that metric and it was, you know, I stared at it for a while wanting to disbelieve it, but, mm-hmm. but of course I've, I've seen enough data to know that it's, know that it's true. Um, and 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 before we move on to Industry Week, I'll I'll, I'll uh, launch the news here is that I'm I'm actually writing one more column for Industry Week and then hanging it up. Um, been doing it. A, I'd, I'd have to go back and look. But been, yeah, yeah. I want to say ten years. Um, it's been a long run, and before that, it was Assembly Magazine. I wrote a mm-hmm. column for. So I remember that quite quite a long run. So writing one more column, which will be kind of my <laughs> my parting piece, and then I'll, I'm going to hang up the. Uh, how to hang up the, the, the column uh, effort. Well, as always, we'll put a link to the article, listicle, slideshow, whatever we're calling it. <laughs> we'll put that on the blog post for this episode. You can find it at uh, leanblog.org slash whiskey four is where you can find um, episode four. And you can always find all episodes by going to leanwhiskey.com. And uh, we'll mention it again at the end, but Jamie, through the, the link for your webpage. Yeah, it's jflinch.com slash uh, forward slash lean whiskey. Yeah. So um, the article, and again, this is kind of coincidental. So we, we ended up with, well, I, what, I chose a whiskey that complemented Jamie's whiskey, but this was a coincidence where one thing that really caught my eye recently was a Boston Globe editorial. Headline reads, getting an accurate count on medical errors. So here we are talking about metrics and measures, and we'll post a link to this. But one thing early in the editorial, the, the authors asked, is it too much to ask the U.S. healthcare system to have a common agreement on what's a medical mistake and how they should be counted? Because there's a wide range of estimates. They quote Arthur Levin, a, a longtime healthcare advocate and contributor to the 1999 report to Air is Human, uh, he says there is no national report, no national reporting system worth its salt, which is interesting. And then, you know, kind of the last thing to pull out from the article, I want to get, you know, Jamie, get your, um, your reactions. You know, is this statement really true here and other places? It says, quote, getting the right number is vital. Without accurate statistics, it's harder to isolate problems and solve them. Yeah, I highlighted that quote as I read the article, um, and uh, and because it really caught it really caught my eye as starting to frame what kind of problem are we trying to solve here, and and especially because the main focus of the article wasn't on different types of hospital related deaths. It was just on the total number. Right. Right. And and in the end, other than shocking people or not shocking people, I don't know how much value that has. Right. Just like, Hey, we injured a bunch of people or Hey, there's been a lot of car accidents. That that tells me nothing other than maybe I want to dig in. And at this point, if we don't know we should want to dig into medical errors, then we haven't been paying attention. Certainly, the hospitals themselves should know should know that by this point. So, my belief is that you know, first of all, the the metric of how many people uh, died because of healthcare is relatively useless, and having an industry standard isn't that much use. Doesn't really add a lot of value other than the point around benchmarking that we talked about. 
And again, only some people are going to really do that benchmarking in an effective way. What's more important in my book is each hospital having a clear way in which they want to measure their errors and go fix their errors. Well, and at a hospital level, and I think, you know, you, you, you can fix hospital culture or you can make strides to creating an environment where it's safe for people to do honest reporting. There are so many of the efforts at, at hospitals like Virginia Mason Medical Center and others that have been really great interconnected progress between lean and patient safety in the first phase in the early years, they see the number of reported near misses, incidents, injuries, and death, the number of those reports goes up. And this leads to headlines that are misleading. The number of reported cases goes up. And like, well, no, that's, that's more honest reporting. Yep. And, 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 you know, you, you know, they've got these wide ranging estimates. I, I agree with you. I don't, Try to think through, you know, if the estimate is 98,000 deaths a year or 200,000 or 440,000 estimates. As, and it's a, it, it's a big problem and it's something that, that should get attention. And we can do things to identify risk and causes of harm um, so that we can improve processes and, and try to get that number down, which, which is very, very local activity. That's not national activity. Yeah, and, and, and there's, you know, I think spreading best practices uh, can be national activity. Mm-hmm. But I, and, and so I think there's some value there. So I don't want to dismiss it out of hand that a nationalized system is, is useful, and I will come back to what, how it should be created. But, but I think it's not nearly as valuable as a hospital-specific system uh, because it, it does have to be fixed locally, because it's based on process and systems and, and what type of errors we're experiencing. Um, and, and so, what I, first of all, I think what a hospital should do in creating a metric is putting a qualifier on every reported case of would this have been reported under the old system, yes or no? And then you kind of say, hey, we have 80% of the new reports would not have been reported in the old system, therefore, you know, it's good that we're raising these issues. But, but ultimately, you know, unless, unless the type of errors are so systematic that they're baked in to our medical education system, right? So every, every doctor is being taught the wrong thing that's killing people, then sure. But, but I, I have a hard time believing that's where most of our issues come yeah. versus localized processes. <clears throat> So I think coming back to that quote, without accurate statistics, it's harder to isolate problems and solve them. I, I don't think that's true. But what we need is people being aware of risks, near misses, um, incidents without harm, where sometimes you, you just luck out. And you identify those moments and those events. That's not statistics. Um, so that, that's one other reaction. But then, you know, the, the high end of those estimates nationally, I don't know if you've heard, you know, the one number from Johns Hopkins, 440,000 deaths a year, which would make medical error the third leading cause of death in the United States. And that number gets attention, but it also leads to this backlash where people say, oh, that number is hogwash. That can't po-. It, it's a mix of skepticism and denial. And it's tinged by, it's like, here's the catch 22. That's going to make me take another sip of whiskey. <laughs> um, healthcare puts real barriers in the way of accurate reporting. And then when physicians and researchers do their best to come up with estimates, everyone poo poos the estimates. Like, I don't know if you can really have it both ways, healthcare. <laughs> Probably not. And, and, and I will, I will say there's, there's sort of a gut check around that 450,000 that, doesn't smell right. And, and I think the, the way they framed it was the one in three hospital deaths had to be an error mm-hmm. versus the fact that you're basically admitting people who are sick already. So, so it does seem like a high number, uh, just instinct, but, uh, but, 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 but either way, right. I mean, I don't want to say who cares whether it's a hundred or 400,000 um, irrelevant to what happens next to improve it. Right? And that's, 
I think that's the, the, the ultimate key is that the, the grand number is a big number, period. Yeah. And, and whatever it is, uh, spending a lot of time on deciding which it is, isn't as valuable as a single hospital, you know, bucking down and, and working on making improvements. Yeah. Now, I, I think if we do want a national number, there's sort of two ways to go about this. There's the way the movie industry did, which is, you know, creating ratings, uh, you know, PG-13 and R, which was an industry-led initiative. Or we wait for the government to try to come up with a measure, which would take 10 years yeah. to create and still probably wouldn't well, tell us anything. So there are two, when you talk about grades or, or ratings, um, there are two well-known ratings. One is the fe- one is the federal government and Medicare or Medicaid services has uh, a, a star rating where every hospital gets between one and five stars. There's a website called hospital. I think it's hospitalcompare.gov. Let me, I don't want to, you can Google search hospital. Uh, no, it's not hospitalcompare.gov. Do, do Google, Google search for hospital compare. So there's that. Uh, it's buried under medicare.gov slash hospital compare slash search dot html question mark. That's a beautiful URL. <laughs> well, we don't want to actually present the data so that people can find it. So. Yeah. So do, do Google search for hospital compare. And then there's an organization called Leapfrog Group, which was not industry people. This was a coalition of, of payers, large companies who are paying for health insurance and, and some others who are advocating for better quality and safety, they give letter grades to hospitals. And sometimes these rent, these, these different scores are not correlated where you have a five-star hospital getting a C letter grade or, or vice versa. So that just kind of goes to show how difficult this is. Well, it's difficult. And, and, and I, I think they're also looking at, uh, you know, a very small sample size of data. Mm. Uh, or incomplete I, data. Yeah. Very incomplete data as they, as they do that. Um, there's also a question of, you know, who the customer is. Is that the patient or the, or the hospital administration, right? Because, you know, we, we, we see this in uh, certain countries with, uh, with, with food services where they get a grade, right? This, this restaurant's an A and that one's a C. And it's right outside, and then you, you're standing outside and going, I don't want to go in. It's a C. Um, but with the hospital, many of the people walking in, once they're walking in, they don't have a choice. <laughs> so yeah. if, if I'm walking into a hospital, you know, I, I, I don't know all the data behind this because I'm not a doctor, but anxiety is not good mm-hmm. for healthy, healthy recovery from wherever you're visiting a hospital. And I would imagine walking into a C uh, a C hospital hmm. would probably make them a C, right? Just by the anxiety levels that that would raise. That's I hadn't thought about that because I have heard people make the comparison. Restaurants have to put that letter in the window. Like in college in Chicago, we used to go to this burrito place that I'm sure, well, we knew it was dirty. It was probably a D or an F from a health and, uh, and cleanliness standpoint, but man, it was delicious and it was open late. So we chose to go there. Yeah, you uh, could handle anything then anyway. Yeah, when you're young and whatever. But I mean, it's this question of um, do you protect people from from data or, or does transparency force improvement that turns the C's into B's and A's? Well, and I, I think the fundamental question for any metric anywhere, right, inside a company, in a factory, in a hospital, at a national level, whatever, you got to ask with any metric, who's going to use it and what are they going to do with it? Mm -hmm. Because if they, if you don't know who's going to use it, you certainly can't answer this next question, which is what are they going to do with it? And if, if the people are going to shop around hospitals and it's going to force change, then that's a good thing. If it's going to raise anxiety levels, it's probably a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Um, If it's going to drive improvement, that's a fantastic thing, but who, who's really going to use the metric and what are they going to do with it? Because if they can't act on it, then it's just, you're just creating information for the sake of creating information. Yeah. Or, you know, how is it going to be used? I mean, I, I, something I've, I, I think this is my expression. If I, if, if I should be quoting someone, I apologize for not doing so. But data 
or metrics. Metrics should be used for improvement, not for punishment. And that's a really strong dynamic in healthcare sometimes. What do you plan? If you plan on using that data for punishment, you will get inaccurate data. And I think that hampers improvement. A- absolutely. Unless you have a really pure system for measurement. Um, and, and, and also, you know, certain punishments do, do yield, you know, then yield improvements. And, and so whether it's embarrassment or uh, pay or other things, I, I do believe it's okay. But if it's just, if it's just to say, here's, <laughs> here's who's good and here's who's bad, I'm not sure there's a lot of value. So, yeah. uh, so, so, but, you know, this, this is interesting, uh, interesting article. Um, I'm not sure it's going to lead to much change because yeah. it doesn't say anything different than what Arthur had said in the 1999 report, yeah. uh, which he's still saying today. Yeah. So and before moving on, though, I was curious to throw kind of a version of that quote back at you, Jamie, thinking about the either your time at Chrysler or Harley Davidson. Would this statement seem accurate in these settings without quali- without accurate quality and defect statistics, it's harder to isolate problems and solve them. So if you look at like the different JD power measures and the, the defects per vehicle, and like, it wasn't necessary in those settings to have accurate statement, statistics to be able to improve quality. Yeah, so I think, especially in the quality data, you know, it really depended on what it was being, again, the same question, who's using it and what are they using it for? I think in a lot of cases it did provide value, um, but but the JD Power as a as a good example is you know we would get data from JD Power uh, to our factory which which was our product, but ninety percent of the issues I don't know if it was ninety percent but a significant percentage of of the issues were design issues, and and mm. they weren't teased out from the product quality issues and manufacturing issues. They were just, here's what the customer complained about. And, and, and so it, you know, the, the aggregate number was still pretty useless. Um, knowing whether your first, second or third was fun. It was nice marketing. Yeah. If you were high, you would celebrate. If you were low, you would discredit everybody else. But, but um, you really had to spend some time with the data to make sure it, it provided some value because yeah. Again, it was just data. It wasn't, it wasn't designed to help solve a problem. And that's, that's what a good metric should do. That's what good statistics should do is yeah. it should be designed with a user in mind to help that person yeah. make it. And, and, and I think the user was intended to be the automakers, but like you said, these get used in marketing. Have you seen you? I'm going to pick on Chevy. You know, I used to work for GM. You know, there, there's the Chevy ads that supposedly have real people, not actors. Right. <laughs> And there's a guy from, I think he's got a thick Boston accent, so I'm sure he's from Boston because he talks about the Patriots. But he, he kind of does a parody of these commercials where he inserts himself digitally into some of these ads and is kind of just making fun of the whole process. And there's one of them, and he's like, who, is, who the bleep is J.D. Power? Is that even a real person? <laughs> just laughing at it and Chevy – you know, it's talking about, you know, uh, short-term reliability. And he's like, well, why don't you have any awards for long-term reliability? Because <laughs> right. everyone aw- everyone's got an award, right? Yeah. And, and that's the problem is by the time the awards come out for long-term quality, the product line is turned over. And, uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and that's, that's the real issue is by the, you know, the brand can have a long-term quality issue or a, or a, yeah, uh, a win, but a model can't because by the time it's long term, it's product has turned over. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm always curious with those commercials who hasn't watched TV and is still surprised <laughs> when they see this guy that he's, oh, you're talking about four. No, that's one of the things he makes fun of. <laughs> like, who hasn't seen this guy yet? It's the only thing you know him for. <laughs> right. Oh, so that we, we've, 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 we've both touched on commercial pet peeves, which maybe I guess that's a segue uh, to a segment we started last episode with Chris Burnham. Uh, it's a short segment, lean pet peeves. Uh, Jamie, what's, what's a lean pet peeve of yours? Well, here, here, here's one that's utterly useless, but it still just gets me every time. Is that makes keep, it a pet peeve. That, that is, that, that's, a fair, that's a fair point. 
<laughs> but it's when people spell lean with all caps. Yeah. And, and I don't know why people do it. I think that's the, that's the thing that bothers me the most. But of course, the impact is somewhat that, that uh, uh, people think it's an acronym or something. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, there's a consequence. But, but the real thing that bugs me is, where did that come from? And I, it, it, I have no idea. And it, it, every single time, like I don't edit yeah. other people's slides unless they ask me to, but, but I can't help not comment on that. I, and that was the first um, one I taught. That was the first lean pet peeve that came to mind when Chris and I talked about that in episode three, because like I said, whether you put periods in between the letters or not, <laughs> um, one of the higher traffic web pages on leanblog.org is a page that says headline is lean an acronym because I think when people type that literally into yes. Google and the page I'm patting myself on the back sorry uh, it says no in big letters and there's a big long gap like okay so <laughs> what does lean stand for um yeah, I don't know where that started. I see a lot um, related pet peeve, and I've talked to people at like the the Institute for Industrial and Systems Engineers magazine will capitalize not all caps, but they'll capitalize the S's in six sigma because that's a formal methodology, and then they put lean with a lowercase l. And I even wrote to the editor, I'm like, and he he pointed like, oh, it's the AP style guide. I'm like, I don't know what the AP, the Associated Press knows about lean or six sigma, but that inconsistency bugs me and it's unimportant. So that makes it a pet peeve. Yep. Yep. Oh, that's, I, I think that's a fair one. And uh, you know, we, we both react to the, you know, whether lean six sigma is even a real thing or not. So, uh, so it, it certainly, uh, certainly has its own trigger when you compare the two where a six, six and, and to be fair, you know, six sigma is rolled out with a, a very regimented structure with, with, with stuff. And so I, I, I can see why people feel that should be capitalized where lean is more ambiguous and harder to pin down. And it's a community that doesn't even agree with itself. And yeah. I, I do see why people can, can get to that one. Do you want to do another pet peeve or save it for next time? Well, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll share one that I think is more relevant because I think, you know, that, I, we, we do try to provide advice to people and, and uh, other than not sending me an email with all caps and lean, yeah. not, not very actionable. So a bigger one is the, the over focus on, on training as you know, lean equals doing training mm-hmm. equals lean plans is doing training. And, and it's, you know, it, it really feels to people like they're doing something like they attended training and then their plan is to send other people to training. And it's very measurable. It is very measurable and it feels like action, right? Because it's like, oh, look, I, yep, I'm excited about this. I want other people to be excited about it. So I'm going to send them to training too. But it's, it doesn't change anything, right? It just maybe gets you excited or a little informed. And it's not the real, it's not the real work of lean is training. It's right. Now it's not, it's not in, it's not useless. It's I trained right. for right. years. It's, it's, a, it's an important task in the in the portfolio of ways to learn but um uh, but the overly focus and when i say over focus i mean you know 75 to 100 percent of your plan is about training and I, I just see that too much and it, it it irks me more and more over time well and and related pet peeve is the over reliance on certifications or belts and again that's measurable as an add on to the training. And, you know, know, the last manufacturing company I worked for Honeywell had an approach of lean and six Sigma, the belts that they did were totally six Sigma. So they would do green belts and and they would try to, you know, they were trying to educate people and education's good, but you know, they, they would, they would really tout the number of green belt certificates on the wall. And if that number of green belts was 500, and each of those, you know, belts, they did require a project. So it wasn't, it wasn't just training. I think the number of completed green belt projects out of 500 certifications was probably 503. 
<laughs> because you certified people. They did one project to get certified. And then unfortunately, the culture wasn't really allowing people to do more. It's like, so why'd you certify them? Why'd you belt them? Why'd you train them? Right. Well, and before we move on from pet peeves, I, going back to our, we're doing this over, over uh, recording. I, I think if we did it in, per, in person, this episode could be half about whiskey and half about pet peeves. <laughs> Is that a different podcast series called Lean Pet Peeves? It, 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 it might be. Maybe, but. Maybe, maybe we'll do a full episode that's nothing but pet peeves and we'll have the whiskey before we start. Yeah, three hour, a three hour episode <laughs> where we just rant and rave. So, yeah. um, so, so moving on to some of the, the, other, the other stuff we, we've been doing and we still have lots of good questions to get to. Um, but we did, we did have one. I know you're a huge Deming fan. I, I am too, but you're much better at honoring his, his legacy. Uh, but we had one that, that, uh, that, that came out about this. And so I'm going to, I'm just read it. So we, we get the, the, the essence from, from the reader. Um, he said that one of the things that stuck out to me is the, the most when learning about Deming's 14 points in school was point 12, which is, abolishment of the annual or merit rating and of management by objective. Uh, this is still very common in companies and I've never seen this discussed in any whatsoever. Still very fairly new to, to new on my lean journey. So it's not like I've seen or heard every discussion out there, but it's a pretty strong position to take and doesn't get discussed while some lean proponents actually appear to be fans of annual reviews. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason this point gets so little attention? So as our as a resident uh, Deming uh, uh, fanboy slash expert, yeah. why don't you take the, the first crack at this? Yeah, well, and Deming, boy, he he could go off on a rant. He was known for that in his writing or in his workshops. You know, I, I think it's interesting. I mean, a couple of points here. One, like, I, I, there's this inter interesting question I don't know the answer to. Does Toyota do traditional annual reviews and performance ratings. I, do you know, do you know, Jamie? I, I, I believe they do. Yeah. Um, but, but it's, I would guess so. I, I think the difference is, and, and this, this is the heart of, of my thought on this is that um, by the time you get to that performance review, you have no surprises because every manager is a coach for 364 days of the year. And then on, you know, the 365th, they write a review. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And, and so it's, you know, where these things get the worst case is when, you know, you're running afoul of your manager and you don't know what to expect from this manager or that manager. And then they write you a bad review when you thought you were doing everything right. And yeah. I, I, I can't imagine that happens at Toyota very often. And, yeah. and if it does, it's more likely the manager gets action taken on them than the employee does. Yeah. Well, so, you know, Deming would say, you know, the role of managers is not to judge, especially in a yearly batch. The role of a manager is to help people improve. Uh, so I, well, I hear you saying, and I, you know, I'll give General Electric credit. GE and Jack Welch were known for the classic annual review process and the old rank and yank where I think it was like, you know, you fire the bottom 10% and even Jack Welch now disowns that idea because I, I think it's easy to see how dysfunctional that could get when you when you have like such an arbitrary cutoff like that. So GE has evolved and they've shifted from annual reviews to a much more continuous feedback and review system, which is one of the things Dr. Deming advocated for. He said, get rid of the annual review and substitute leadership. And I think this ongoing coaching development approach as you were describing, Jamie, seems like um, you know, more, more, more constructive, but there, there's this element to the question of, you know, why does this get so little attention even from lean proponents? I think a lot of lean proponents, unfortunately, just have never been exposed to Deming. You know, I, I got exposed to Dr. Deming early in my career, almost before I got exposed to the Toyota stuff. And a lot of people haven't had that opportunity. So they're just unaware. And I think they say, well, they, they take it for granted that companies must have annual performance reviews, sort of like they assume, they must have an accounts payable department or, you know, it's just taken for granted in, in the corporate infrastructure. Yeah. I, I think there's, there's, there's a couple things to, to, to keep in mind here. One is, 
you know, Deming's role in a lot of ways was to, to make declarative statements that force people in a new direction. Mm-hmm. Whether, whether what he was saying was feasible to the degree in which he was stating it is, is almost irrelevant, right? And we, we talked about this in, I forget which episode, about, I mentioned Tom Johnson. He, he would say things that were probably not even legal, but by thinking about it made you better. And, and so some of Deming's points, I believe, are, are North Stars rather than practical mm-hmm. advice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the you, other, you mentioned you mentioned that was, that was episode one, by the way. Where you ah, mentioned thank you, Johnson. Yeah, and, and so the other the other thing is though, when Deming said this, um, we didn't have the environment we have today. I, I, you know, there the litigious environment where today, you know, if you're going to give out raises other than you know X percent across the board as peanut butter, you, you need to justify it. And what are you going to justify it with if you don't do some kind of performance review? And companies are required today to to run statistics for good reason, by the way, uh, to to verify that they're not they're not giving all the men twice as big a raise as all the women or whatever other bias that might exist. Yeah. So they they have to they have to check their own their own uh, performance as a company around giving raises and and uh, all of this. And so so th- there's a necessity, I think, behind it. In, in today's day and age that really didn't exist in Demi's. And that's, yeah. you know, that we, we can, we can wish for that day and age, but I, I think since it's, since we're not there, we're where we are, where we are, it's about how do we make the most of it today? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, final thought that's triggered by the question here is the question of management by objective and a lot of management by objective sets a target and then anything better than the target is green and anything worse than the target is red. And I think, you know, Deming would say, well, you need to understand variation. Um, understanding variation is the title of Don Wheeler's uh, amazing book. Wheeler learned from Deming. Um, I try to write about this uh, gratuitous plug in measures of <laughs> success that Dr. Right. Wheeler wrote the foreword for, but you know, I, t- I taught a workshop a couple of months ago and a healthcare leader was in the class and we're talking about the red green and sometimes metrics fluctuate between red and green and dipping into the red might not be statistically significant in the least. And she said she had been green for the first 11 months of the year. And then it dipped into the red. And because of that final 12 month of the year, she got no raise because her metric ended the year in the red. Gave, giving giving no uh, um, benefit from being green 11 out of 12 months. And again, the red was just common cause variation fluctuation. Yeah, that'll do, that, that gets demoralizing. And, and somebody may have lucked into a pay raise. Yeah, I imagine there was someone who was red for 11 months and just right. happened to fluctuate green. And that's why Deming said, you know, annual performance reviews, ah, you might as well call it a lottery. Because unfortunately, there can be elements of that. Absolutely. And, and, you know, in the, in the institutional advisor space, there's lots of push to tie, uh, you know, more executive pay to uh, stock performance, but Mm -hmm. the biggest impact on stock performance is the stock market itself, not company (laughs) performance. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and Mm -hmm. and so it's, it's uh, so sure, you know, you, you pay somebody for doing things in a, in the month of June, and they're going to be pretty excited about that because it was a good good stock market month, and their stock yeah. is up, and yeah. and they didn't have to do anything for that to happen. So, so I think you know the management by objective means that the the how also matters, mm-hmm. and and that's why I think again going back to Toyota's example, like you do know what's important, what objectives we need to hit, what goals we need to hit, and then we'll talk about the how, and and what's key is that it's a collaboration, right? So. So no employee wants to be told everything about how to do their work, but also just setting an objective and letting the person squat, squ- uh, flounder, uh, not, not knowing how to achieve it is also bad. And, and so the right. key, the best solution is you focus on the how in a collaborative environment between the employee and the manager. All right. So if you're listening and you have questions that you want us to talk about and realizing we're, we're, t- 
Uh, the one whiskey isn't making a huge difference. We're doing these questions after we've gotten into our, our glass of whiskey. We'll probably hopefully give you good answers anyway. You can email leanpodcast at gmail.com if you want us to talk about something uh, in the future. So uh, before we wrap up, you, you had another question. It's a Jamie question. Yeah, so we, you know, we like to have some fun on this too. So I, I was kind of asking my son, we were driving, I forget where, and I said, hey, what would be a fun, like just closing question for the, for the podcast? Mm-hmm. And so he said, what show would you most want to binge watch? Mm. Um, I was, you know, for, for a guy, I'm usually trying to get off, you know, an electronic device. I thought yeah. it's an interesting question. And, um, and, and it was actually pretty easy for me. I have two shows that are at the opposite ends of the intellectual spectrum. Yeah. Um, that, that I, I both will binge watch when I have the opportunity. One is Amazon Prime's The Grand Tour. And what, what is that about? I haven't heard well, that. Well, if you've ever seen Top Gear, it's the three British guys that really uh, Top Gear for 15 years going to Amazon, and, and now they have a new show called The Grand Tour. I think there's three seasons into it. Um, and it's, you know, it's about ridiculous cars and ridi- ridiculous adventures and a lot of humor. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just fun. It's just, yeah. just fun to watch. And I enjoy that a lot. But at the other end of the spectrum, probably my favorite show of all time, and I actually was gifted the box set at one point. And I'm always, I'm always afraid to touch it because when I do, I know I'm watching the entire series, not, not <laughs> so much in a binge series, but I'm not watching, I'm not watching other stuff until I'm, I'm done watching this. And it's West wing ah. which was on many years ago, but you know, it was just so intellectual and, you know, 40 storylines going on at once and, and complex and funny and, and, um, and, and honestly not, not one of these political shows that picks, like, yes, it was a Democrat in, in, in office, but it wasn't wildly to the left or wildly to the right. There was a lot of understanding of nuance of, of issues that political sides tend to take extreme sides on today. So I just, it was just easily my favorite show to watch. And once I get into it, it's hard for, hard, hard for me to stop. Yeah. I, you know, I never watch West Wing. Um, I'm not normally a binge watcher. Um, Sometimes shows stack up on the DVR and I'll watch a couple. I don't know if that really counts as binge watching, but yeah, I, I've considered, you know, like there's some shows that people really rave about and I've, I've like literally never seen a minute of any of these shows like Mad Men. Nope. Never Fire, seen it. Never saw it. Breaking Bad. People are like, oh, I love Breaking Bad. I'm like, I, I don't know. Um, I did binge watch. And this is going back like younger listeners. You're like, do you, do you remember DVDs? <laughs> you know dvds we uh my wife and i've been we, we were still we weren't uh married yet this was probably thanksgiving 2000 we got the dvd of the first season of the show 24 mm, yes and because we were at her parents uh, over a long weekend i think by definition of binge watching of the 24 episodes we watched i think like six the first night they're 45 minutes each and it's getting to be like 1 a.m and we're like <laughs> ah, can we do one more? Can we stay awake? And we, we plowed through all 24 episodes in, in the weekend. Um, but I, I, I think one, I would, I think it would be fun to binge watch or rewatch. I like comedies and I'll occasionally catch on a plane in old episode of 30 rock. I would, I think really enjoy going back and just watching the entire for at least first season or the first couple seasons. Um, I, that, that, that's probably what I would choose then. Yeah, I have not seen a rerun of that for a long time. And that, that was a, uh, that was John Lithgow, right? Oh, that's third rock from the sun. Oh yeah. 30. I'm sorry. 30. Rock. Yes. I yeah. remember 30 rock. I'm, 30 rock was Tina Fey. That, and was Tina Fey. that was a, that was a good show too. And, and the, the mocking of GE six Sigma culture. Oh yes. yes. Jack Donaghy was a six Sigma black belt ultimate. Yeah. <laughs> it's he said in one episode so yeah. all right well that ends our our fun for the evening you want to do you want to wind us down yeah so we want to thank everyone for listening and we hope you enjoy this uh, if you want to find different links for subscribing you can 
for one, you can go to Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher. You can also go to leanwhiskey.com. Whether you spell whiskey, K-E-Y or K-Y, it works just the same. Or you can go to leanblog.org slash leanwhiskey. And then Jamie's website is worth checking out as well. Yep. So that's jflinch.com forward slash lean whiskey. Uh, so, you know, we hope is whatever your uh, format you listen on, please, please rate us, please review us, please subscribe. Um, we have, you know, we have some five-star ratings so far. We, we appreciate that, but it, but it also helps uh, get, get this out for others to, to, to find us. Um, so we really appreciate any, any feedback you have, whether public or private, we, we always appreciate that. So yeah, we're, we're both pretty easy to find online. Absolutely. So on our way out, do you have any whiskey left? I, I have, I have a sip left. Okay. Final sip. So to Nika. Nika. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>